Those of you that are watching online with us, we're so glad that you chose to be with us on this uh, slightly warmer winter morning. I had a call from my mom last night to see if, if things had started defrosting yet at where we are, and she's in Pennsylvania, so they always get the weather just a little bit after us. So they're, they're experiencing the cold that we had a day or two ago. But it's good to be together, as Mark said, to stir each other up to love and to good works, to be together as a body of believers, brothers and sisters. That's what we're called to do, and we're called to worship together, and so glad we could do that today. So as I said during communion, we're talking about rejection today. Valentine's Day is coming up in, in just a couple of weeks, and that's a time of love, a time that we hope that we are accepted and loved, but sometimes with love also comes rejection, and it never feels good, does it? How many of you can remember being picked last for dodgeball at school because everybody looked at you and said, they're going to be terrible. Even if they don't even know you, they're going to just not pick you. And you got assigned to a team because the gym teacher said, oh, you're on that team. And they went, oh. being rejected by your classmates hurts. Or maybe there was a sleepover. A group of your friends were getting together and they're whispering about it in the hallway and nobody says anything to you and you're waiting. Am I going to be invited? Am I going to be invited? And you don't get invited. And then on Monday morning, they're all talking about the fun they had together and the, the people you thought were your closest friends left you out. That really hurts. Or maybe you've been working hard at your job. You've been doing the little extra things that nobody else seems to notice. You want your boss to see you and at least acknowledge that you're trying, that you're working hard. Maybe there's a promotion or some, something coming up that you're just hoping that you'll be noticed, that you'll be recognized, and you'll, your hard work will pay off. Being rejected, being looked over by your boss is painful. Or maybe you sent a text to a guy or a girl that you thought maybe they liked you and they never responded. Even though you got that little notification that the message was read, that's even harder. You were ghosted, you were rejected, and you feel unwanted and undesirable. We're smiling about it, but we know what that feels like. It hurts. You're not alone in these heartbreaks. Jesus knows exactly how you feel. He cares about you, and he offers healing for that pain. We're continuing in our series in the Gospel of Mark. It's called The Crown and the Cross. And here, the Gospel writer Mark, with the inside scoop from the Apostle Peter, is presenting Jesus as a man with a mission. He has a clear message of God's call to repentance, a call to be part of the family, and he, the reader is actively called to respond to that message. Not to just hear it, but to respond. What do I do now that I've heard this? Jesus' life on earth also helped us better understand God the Father because we saw his character played out in Jesus' life. The way Jesus loved people, the way Jesus cared for people is the way God loves and cares for us. In the first half of the book, the crown, we saw Jesus being revealed as the Messiah, and the people are ready to crown him, and he avoids that happening. It says that he slipped out so that the crowd couldn't do that. And then in the second half, Jesus is on the move to Jerusalem, and he's told his disciples three times that he must die, but that he would rise again. He's going to die on the cross and pay for our sins. Last week, we had a guest missionary speaker, John Fry. But the week before that, we saw that Jesus was falsely accused. Judas betrayed him, one of his close friends, another rejection. And Jesus stood firm 
under all of the attacks, even though most of them were false, he just stood and let them hurl these insults at him. We saw him stand firm while Peter, who promised to stay with Jesus to the very end, crumbled under accusations, and he even denied knowing Jesus. So this morning we're in Mark chapter 15. You can turn there so you're ready. Our parallel passages are Matthew 27, Luke 23, and John 18. John doesn't always weigh in, but in this particular one, he has a lot to say about Jesus and his rejection. If you are just joining us for the first time today or maybe online, you can find those sermons on our website. You can also go to the YouTube page, First Baptist Dunkirk, and you can catch up on any of those messages that you missed. So in today's passage, after the religious leaders have had their own kind of fake trial in the middle of the night, now they turn Jesus over to Pontius Pilate, the local Roman governor. And Pilate is going to ask the crowds, what should I do with Jesus? Sadly, but according to all that was prophesied, Jesus will be rejected by his own nation and condemned to die. Jesus knows the pain of rejection. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we hear your word, as we dig into it deeper, help us to understand what happened that day that you stood before Pilate, being accused, being condemned. Thank you that you were steady and stable, that you carried out the will of your Father, even though there was so much pressure on you as a man. I pray, Lord, that as we hear your word this morning, we would take it to heart, that we would be listening for ways that we can apply it, listening for ways that you're speaking to us through your word, through your Holy Spirit, and help us, Lord, to go into this new week ready to carry out the gospel mission, the gospel message. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. So if you want to turn to Mark chapter 15, we're going to hear this narrated and see a little bit of what this might have looked like on the video screen. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now, it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists, who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him! They shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder. Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, They paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him.
Then they led him out to crucify him. You can stop it there. Thank you. It's hard to watch, isn't it? But it gives us a little bit more of a picture of what was happening. Jesus was questioned and accused. He was delivered to Pontius Pilate. The day in the Middle Eastern time started at 6 p.m. That was the beginning of a new day instead of what we have as 12 a.m., the beginning of our day. And this goes all the way back to the Genesis creation account where it says, God said there was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening and morning the second day. So each of those days of creation started with evening and then morning. Mark divides the daytime part of Christ's death clearly into four three-hour periods, which lines up with the Roman military watches of the night. Just like we saw in the previous passage, where each of the times the rooster crowed, that was another watch changing. And we went from midnight to 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Mark could be drawing our attention to these events unfolding so that we can see it's all part of God's plan, even to the hour God knew what was going to happen and when it would happen. And also, as Mark is writing to a mostly Roman audience, it would help them connect and see, oh yeah, this is, this is the way we keep time. This, this makes sense to us. So the Jewish council of 70 religious leaders of the Sanhedrin gathered together. They had met during the night. They found no reliable witnesses. They found no one that could agree in their made-up stories. But still, they said, Jesus is guilty, and we want to see him die. We want him dead. He's a threat to us. But they didn't have the power to carry out the death sentence. They could carry out small punishments for things that were done against the law, but they couldn't execute someone. So they brought Jesus to the Roman authorities, the ones that had that power. For the Jews, blasphemy was worthy of death. And if you remember, the high priest ripped his clothing when Jesus said, I am the Son of God, and you're going to see me in my glory, seated at the Father's right hand. He clearly stated, I am the Son of God. Blasphemy for the Jews was worthy of death. But the Romans could care less about that. So instead, they tried to portray Jesus as a political insurrectionist as someone who was dangerous to Rome, as someone who was trying to raise up an army to overthrow the Roman government. Again, that was part of their picture of the Messiah because all of their previous heroes, their judges, had come to rescue Israel. And now that they are being inhabited by the Roman forces, they thought, here comes the Messiah. He's going to rescue us from Rome Treason was a capital offense, and that would bring the death sentence if Pilate found him guilty. So who's Pilate? He's labeled here just Pilate, but we know that his official name is Pontius Pilate. He's the Roman governor with authority over Samaria and Judea, and he was ruling from about 26 AD to 36 AD. As Jerusalem was located in Judea, in the southern part of Israel, that was under his jurisdiction. Pilate normally would have been out in Caesarea, right on the Mediterranean Sea. So if you're going to be stationed in a foreign country, you're going to pick the best place to live. So he has a a palace built right there on the sea, overlooking the Mediterranean. He's enjoying that, but it's Passover. And if you recall... Hundreds of thousands of Jews from all over Israel descended to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, for them to offer a lamb for their family and to remember that they were freed from slavery, to remember that they had a God who would redeem them. So Pilate comes to Jerusalem. There's possibly a million plus people in the city And he comes with his additional guard. They're called the Praetorian Guards, the elite soldiers that are with him. And they come to make sure that 
nothing big happens, that they're going to be ready to stamp out any kind of revolutionary ideas because a million people is a big crowd, even for the Romans. Pilate was known to be a harsh governor. He didn't really care about the Jews. He didn't care about their customs. He wasn't popular. But the religious leaders needed to find a way to get rid of Jesus. So early Friday morning, maybe even before Pilate had his breakfast, it's 6 a.m., they bound Jesus, they tied him up, and they drag or bring him before Pilate, making him again looking like a dangerous criminal, hoping that he would find him guilty of treason. So Pilate looks out at Jesus, and in verse 2, he asks Jesus if those claims are true. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus' answer is, you have said so. This seems like a really strange answer. Why didn't he just say, yes? There's lots of ways that this could be taken. But the bottom line is, again, Jesus turns the question around and puts it on him. You have just stated it. I don't have to say it. You've already said it. I am the king of the Jews. The charge is true. In John 18, Jesus explains further, and Mark doesn't include it here, but Jesus said, my kingdom is a spiritual one. It's not an earthly one. I don't have soldiers. I don't have people ready to set up a palace. It's a spiritual kingdom. I am the spiritual king of the Jews. But again, Mark is written to mostly Romans who are still under the Roman governor. So as Mark is writing this gospel, he's trying to portray Pilate in a kind of good light. He doesn't want to make things worse for the Christians there in Rome. They're being oppressed, and they will be oppressed even further by Nero and others who are going to drag Christians into the lions in the Colosseum. They're going to be burned at the stake. All kinds of terrible things are happening. So Mark gives us less of those details as he writes this gospel. Then the chief priests accuse him even more of more things, possibly repeating the false accusations from the previous night, the things that maybe Pilate didn't care about, none of them are true, and Jesus says nothing. He doesn't answer them. Luke 23, again, gives us more of those details. They say that he was misleading the nation. He was forbidding them to give tribute to Caesar, and he was saying he was their Messiah and King. Again, false accusations. Pilate is amazed that Jesus stands there and takes it all. He doesn't defend himself, and he even says that. Aren't you going to answer any of these accusations? And as Jesus stands there, letting them just fly by, Pilate thinks, none of these things are really true. It says that he recognized that they're foolish charges, and that maybe they're just trying to stir up the crowds against Jesus. It's the religious leaders who don't like Jesus. The rest of the people do. Maybe they really care. Jesus refuses to answer their foolishness. And again, it fulfills the prophecies, the ones that Robert read for us this morning, that he stood before his executioners like a lamb going to slaughter, silent, without opening his mouth. Jesus doesn't try to answer. He doesn't try to change the outcome of the trial because he's already said, Father, your will, not mine. He's not fighting back against any of this. He's letting it happen. But when a true accusation is made, he answers it. Yes, you've said it. I am the king of the Jews. Again, Jesus had predicted this back in Mark 10.33. See, we're going on to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. God knew all of this was going to happen, and Jesus even told them, this is what's going to happen step by step. The Jewish high priest and the council, they're not going to be able to do anything. They're going to turn me over to the Gentiles, and all of these things are happening just as he said. Further proof that he really is 
God. Well, Pilate can't find any grounds for execution. In fact, he appears to be more impressed by Jesus' silence than the hatred and the loud accusations of those religious leaders. He doesn't see a violent traitor in front of him, and so he begins looking for a way out. And again, Luke tells us that there's even more detail to this. Pilate hears that Jesus is from Galilee, so he says, oh, Herod's in town. He's the one who is the Jewish puppet leader over Galilee. I'll send him over to him. So in the middle of that early morning, he goes to Herod, and Herod hears Jesus' accusations. He beats him, and he sends him back, back to Pilate. Herod was the one, if you recall, had John the Baptist beheaded because his wicked wife didn't like the way he preached against her sin. Herod sends him back, and Jesus is rejected. So Pilate asks the crowd. He does what any weak, unprincipled, self-serving politician would do. He asks the people, what do you want? I'll give it to you. It doesn't matter if justice is served. It doesn't matter if an innocent man dies. He wants to look good for the people and in turn look good for his superiors in Rome. Imagine if word got back that he let a treasonous person go free. He really doesn't care about Jewish tradition. He doesn't care about their religion. He just doesn't want an insurrection mob to break out and start a mini-war. Verse 10 says, based on the way the religious leaders were acting and possibly even importing their own lynch mobs, that doesn't happen today, right? When people are talking, we don't have all of a sudden this angry mob appear out of nowhere. Pilate wants to see if there's any validity to these claims against Jesus. So there's a tradition in releasing a prisoner, a way to appease the occupied nation. See, we're doing something nice for you. We're going to let one of your people go. And particularly during this Passover feast, when everybody's around and they can see how kind Rome really is. So in prison, there's a man named Jesus Barabbas. He had committed murder while rebelling against Rome. He was a violent political zealot who fought for freedom for Israel. He was just the kind of Messiah that Israel was looking for. Do you remember Peter's original name? Anybody? Simon, and the second part? Bar-Jonah. Bar means son of. So he was Simon, the son of Jonah. Kind of like um, for the Swedes, they would name someone Sven Svensson. He's Sven, the son of Sven, or Gustav, Gustafsson, the son of Gustav. A number of the commentaries point out that the name Barabbas, if you break it apart like that, is Bar, son of Abbas. And what does Jesus call his heavenly father? Abba. So he's the son of a father. Pilate asks the crowd, who should I release? And again, you heard it in the video A ton of people shouting out names. Possibly they're shouting Jesus, and he's thinking, oh, they want to let Jesus go. But they're shouting possibly for Jesus, Barabbas. The crowd is stirred up by the chief priests, and they say, no, it's Barabbas we want. And the contrast between the two that Mark points out here, we have the true Son of God, Jesus the one who would solve Israel's problems, not using violence, but a spiritual kingdom, one who would save and redeem his people. They reject that king, and they ask for the violent leader, the violent son of a father, a human father, not a heavenly father. So Pilate says, Okay, I'll release Barabbas. It doesn't make any sense, but what do you want me to do with this man? 
and he calls him again the king of the Jews. He doesn't use Jesus' name. He says, what do you want me to do with the king of the Jews? I think he's just digging in a little bit more for those religious leaders. This is your king, mocking them and making them face Jesus as king. The crowd calls out for Jesus' blood, and they cry, crucify him. That's the punishment. That's the death penalty for the worst criminals, the ones that need to be put on display. Pilate looks for another solution still, saying, why? What has he done? And it's now just mob rule. They don't even bother answering. They just shout louder. They cheer more crucify him, crucify him. The promised Messiah has come to Israel, God's chosen people. And the people he came to save, his own people, rejected their Messiah, rejected their true king, and most importantly, their savior, their redeemer. And instead, they choose Barabbas, the son of an earthly father, a violent criminal. So in verse 15, it says, Pilate had Jesus scourged. They wanted, he wanted to quell the mob, and, and again, as we read the other Gospels, he does this possibly just as another step. If I punish him to near death, is that enough for you? Maybe I don't have to sentence him to crucifixion. So finally, we see Jesus beaten and mocked, verses 15 to 20. During the night, the religious leaders, the temple guards, had spit on Jesus. They covered his head, they beat him, and they said, Who hit you, prophet? If you know all things, why don't you tell us who's hitting you now? They mocked him. They mocked who he said he was. And Jesus remained silent before them. And now Jesus is turned over to the Roman soldiers. It says there was a the whole battalion came together. And that could be as many as 600 soldiers. They led Jesus into the palace, which is called the Praetorium. That's the place wherever the governor is. That's its official title. But it's Herod's palace. It's the place where instead of being celebrated as the king of Israel, Jesus is mocked and beaten almost to death. They placed a purple cloak on his shoulders, just like a king would wear. Royalty wore purple because it was an expensive dye. It was something only for the elites. And so they put that on his shoulders. They placed a rod in his hand like a scepter, just like a king would hold, and it was a symbol of his power and authority. And then they twisted together a ring of hard, thick thorns. The Romans were known for using wreaths of laurel, and they would put those on Olympians. They would put them on conquerors as they returned. That was made out of bay leaves, something that smelled nice. It was soft. But here's a crown purposely made of thorns so that it would hurt. And it said they shoved that on his head, and they beat him in the head, driving those thorns deeper and deeper into his scalp. He's got blood pouring from his head. They're carrying out an elaborate mock play. Just like the mob ruled earlier, now a band of bored soldiers, bloodthirsty, crude, preyed on Jesus. And mercilessly, they scourged him. They joked as they said, Hail, King of the Jews! They knelt around him, just like they would have said, Hail Caesar. They spit in his face and they ridiculed him as they knelt around him, pretending to pay homage to the king. And somewhere in this whole nightmare, they scourged him. You saw a picture of what that looked like in the video. There was a post, a whipping post, And his hands would have been bound and tied to the top of that post. His clothes were stripped off so that it was bare flesh. And they took a whip made of multiple strands of leather. And at the end of each piece of leather 
was tied a piece of bone or a little bit of metal, something sharp. The sailors would have called that a cat of nine tails. When that cat came out of the bag, everybody was afraid. They took that and they whipped it across Jesus. And as those bits of bone and metal dug in and they pulled it back, they ripped off flesh, just showing his muscle and blood pouring out. Many people did not survive scourging. They died because it wasn't just 20 lashes or 29 lashes. It was until they stopped. But Jesus didn't die because God had another plan. He knew he would be crucified. None of these things, again, just happened randomly. God was in complete control. And Jesus, now dripping blood from his head, from his back, has his old clothes put back on him. Pilate, maybe trying to appease the crowd, presents him again, and they still want him crucified. As we wrap up this morning, Jesus was rejected. First of all, the Jewish Sanhedrin rejected him because he was a threat to their power. He revealed that they were hypocrites. They went around acting religious, but they could care less about truly honoring God with their hearts. He didn't fit their ideal of a warring Messiah king. They wanted to be rescued from Rome, and he exposed their sin. He showed that all they, call, all they cared about was the minutia of the law. They didn't care about the people. They had no love for those they were called to serve. Jesus was rejected by the Jewish crowd, and they, choose, they chose Barabbas instead. They were disappointed in Jesus, the Messiah. He rode into Jerusalem, and the Galileans, the ones around him, were cheering for him and saying, finally, our king has arrived. Blessed be the son of David. But he didn't take over. He didn't go into the palace and throw out Herod. He didn't get rid of Pilate. He didn't set up an earthly kingdom. They wanted a violent, violent patriot instead of a serving spiritual leader. Jesus said, what it takes to be first in my kingdom is to serve others, to love others. They didn't want to hear that. And finally, the Roman soldiers who were just standing by, they rejected Jesus. They didn't care about a Jewish Messiah, but they tasted blood and they joined in the violence. How do you respond when someone accuses you falsely? Does that get your blood boiling? That's not true. Do you fight back? Do you get angry? Do you defend yourself? God told us to leave vengeance to him. He said, I will repay evil. You don't have to do it. To respond to hatred, Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Respond in love. Yes, it's easy to love someone who loves you. Someone who's being kind and friendly. Yes, you're my best friend now. But someone who hates you to respond in love? Scripture tells us that's how they'll know we're followers of Jesus Christ because we're going against the grain. We're doing something that humanly, physically, we just couldn't keep up. The Holy Spirit can do that, though. The Holy Spirit can help us love even those who hate us. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, Let all bitterness, anger and wrath, clamor and slander be put away from you. But instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God has forgiven you. That's the new person we're supposed to become. Instead, of responding in anger. Maybe you've been rejected by your family, the people that you counted as friends. Maybe that's still painful for you even now. Jesus knows how you feel. He knows what that rejection is like. But Jesus is everything you need. He'll never let you down. He's never going to leave you alone. And he's given you a new family. So even if your earthly family wants nothing to do with you, 
Look around the room. You have brothers and sisters in a family in the church who are here to accept you, to love you, to encourage you, and to help you grow. Maybe you've rejected Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you have said, He's he's not the Son of God. It doesn't really matter. Are you going to listen to religion? Are you going to listen to the majority? Are you going to listen to the people around you who have said, don't bother with Jesus. You don't need Him. Or, if the Holy Spirit is knocking on the door of your heart today, will you respond to Jesus and accept Him? Will you repent of your sins and say, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I want to be part of your family. Will you accept Jesus today? Maybe you've already trusted Him as your Savior, but you're still rejecting Him. I know I'm guilty of this. When I'm hurt, when I'm lost, when I'm looking for answers, do I turn to experts and therapists? Do I Google how do I solve this problem instead of going to His Word? Do I say, I've got to fix this instead of crying out to God and saying, help me? Remember just a couple weeks ago, when I am weakest, then I am strong. God wants us to humble ourselves before Him. Maybe we're running to other people to fill that hurt. We want them to tell us that we're loved. We want them to tell us that we're good enough. Or maybe we're choosing stuff. Just one more order on Amazon. Click, click, click. It's so good to see that package waiting on the doorstep. Or if you have a ring, you're watching it during the day. Is it here? Is it here? Somebody loves me. Oh yeah, it's me. I bought this for myself again. But it feels good, doesn't it? Getting stuff, accumulating stuff. That'll take the pain away. I don't need people. I just need more stuff. Or maybe when that day has been so hard and so painful and people have just left you right and left, you turn to something else. You eat something. You drink something, you inhale something, something that makes you feel a little better. It takes the edge off of that rejection, takes away the pain, temporarily takes away the heartache, or at least you forget about it for a little while. But Jesus promises to fill all of those empty holes in your heart, all of those rejections, all of those needs, And only He can give you real peace, real comfort, lasting love, real belonging. Come to Jesus. He was rejected for you. Don't reject Him. Mark's going to come. We're going to close in a final song. Please bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank You so much for how much You love us. Thank You for accepting us when we are unlovely when we were enemies with you, when we didn't care about following you, you sent your Son to die in our place. Thank you, Father, for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that he was despised and rejected for us so that we could be accepted by you. Father, we come to you. We ask for forgiveness of our sins. If we haven't trusted you before, we repent of our sins. We ask you to be our Savior. And we thank you that you accept us into your family and that you promise to never leave us alone. We will forever be your son, your daughter. Heavenly Father, I pray that anyone this morning that doesn't know you today would be the day that they would accept your love and become part of that great family, recognizing all that your son did on the cross on our behalf. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen.